like I was on another planet. There is a quality of silence that's unique to that environment. You're able to hear your own footsteps. You can hear the crackle of the dry lake bed crust break under each step you take. Each step you take away from your car, you're aware of how much of your body is not designed for the desert. So I understood my own physical limitations and the difference between a natural environment and what is in fact a scar of a process because the dry lake bed is often misunderstood at first glance as a geographic and geological formation rather than what it is, which is a scar that results from the action of removing water and what happens when the sun and wind create a new landscape as a result of the absence of water. The Intermountain West, um, which is the area that this project really focuses on, silver and water, is the territory geographically between the Rockies and the Sierras. The West of the United States was a series of magnificent cascading lakes that stretched all the way from the Sierras to the ocean and one flowed right into another. So it was a paradise. Westward expansion was largely a quest for the mineral wealth of the West. Silver mining was a huge pull to bring people out West and the railways allowed that to happen. And the immense amount of water coming from the Sierras grew a ranching population that supported silver mining. George Eastman had the ability to think through really the first mass-produced art practice that the world would ever know because of the availability of silver that was coming back east to Philadelphia where money is minted. And he developed a pocket instamatic camera he said, you take the picture, we'll do the rest. That was the first promise of Kodak. My story is really about the silver that was exported back east to make photography. Because once he was able to make his business model work, he went on to help make film stock available for filmmakers. That was then shipped back to emerging Hollywood and then taken back to where the silver was mined to begin with to make westerns, which were then exported all around the world as a vision of the West. Another mining phenomena that happened in the same location, which is that water started to be literally mined out of the mountains to feed the emerging city that was growing around film industry. The Mayor of the city of Los Angeles, Mayor Eaton, with his water commissioner, William Mulholland, took a trip in 1905. They very quickly conceived it was possible to move water from the mountaintops where the silver is coming from to Los Angeles simply by gravity. They were simply able to use the mule packing industry, which serviced all the mines from all the ranches to construct an elaborate series of tunnels and pipes that stretched all the way from the tallest peak in the Americas at Mount Whitney to the Cascades here in Los Angeles in seven years. On November 5th, 1913, William Mulholland and Mayor Eaton opened the water at the Cascades with the famous short speech, there it is, take it. It was an incredible feat, actually mind-boggling. That single feat of moving water 240 miles away through a gravity feed has literally redefined glacial time. 
So that portrait I gave you of interlocking lakes that stretched between the Rockies and the Sierras was absolutely changed into the contemporary picture of the West we now know by the emergence of the LA Aqueduct. Owens Lake has been acknowledged by the Environmental Protection Agency as being a carcinogenic catastrophe. The people who planned the LA Aqueduct had no way to know that. They can't be blamed for the fact that arsenic from the dry lake bed is floating around the universe, but it is a problem that we now need to resolve. The work that I'm doing with the studio in many ways can be seen as an act of reconciliation. It's about being present and accountable as witnesses to and storytellers. The world of Mulholland and the people who brokered the LA Aqueduct is gone. The world that will emerge has yet to be born. Since 2005, what's really guided my actions is the notion that artists must create on the same scale that society has the capacity to destroy. Here's this 100-mile scar of the city of Los Angeles. How do we transform this? What can I do? I said, well, it's got to be sound. What is the sound of transformation? I looked at those giant silos at the edge of the dry lake bed, and I imagined that they made a sound so pure that it was capable of actually moving the stagnancy of 75, 80 years of sun-baked decay. So the impulse was to create sound and then communicate it through film. The second impulse was that the Owens Valley is just the Greta Garbo of film sites. There is no bad shot available. So I had these three ideas. The idea of a transformative sound. I had an idea that film could be the vehicle to deliver that transformative sound. And I had the idea that filmmaking as a process could catalyze a community into a new situation. Lauren has constructed a narrative for the valley that she uses for describing what she's doing out there. We have been using the silo for a variety of different things. We've used it for sound. Lauren had the Crystal and Water Orchestra in there. It has functioned as a meeting place. And then with Robert, it functioned as a darkroom. Inside of that silo, inside of that chamber, is where we were developing film for the Robert Shaler workshop with the lake bed developer. And it was inside of that silo that we had the first conversations about the indexical image. And poetically, it's fitting because the silo actually used to hold lake bed. That's where they were mining Trona. We recognized that this could also be a camera. It could be an eye. It could be the observer of the lake. In a sense, it's been there observing but without an eye yeah, for without, so we've, many years. We've talked about how this cylinder has possibly collected years and years of imagery, even without a hole in it. And it's always seeing. It's a witness. It's present, but without an eye. What was so amazing about the creation of the silo camera is that Rich and Tristan did it completely on their own. They 
drilled a hole through that core 10 steel and said, come in, we have to show you something. And it was just an unbelievable experience to realize that they had actually created this monumental image of the landscape inscribed inside of this silo for as long as that silo exists. All of a sudden it let the lake see. in and what was outside became inside. And when you walk into the silo with its hole, you're walking into the lake. You're walking into a 180 degree view of the lake that gets transformed into a 360 degree view. There's a warping that goes on. It's a teleporter. It's a sacred chamber, but it's an eye. And the function of the eye for this long-term project is really important. Our human ancestors probably sat in caves and waited out rainstorms. And when there was lightning bolts, they would have seen forms in the rock. They would have seen their world reflected in the stonescapes. And how do we know that they didn't then go draw them? And that the cave paintings, especially the abstract ones, might have been things that people actually saw in those moments that lightning lit up the cave. And in that way, the silo is a contemporary version of the cave. I had this kind of lightning bolt where I realized all I would really like to get from this whole process is one tiny piece of film that is actually made of the valley, by the valley, about itself. So the entire thing would be made here and we would really know about the economy of this gesture. And it would really talk in some analogous way to the construction of the aqueduct. So to go full circle, you know, it took an extraordinary act of determined focus to take seven years and move water from Mount Whitney to LA. I'm on my fifth year <laughs> and my quest has been to make a single frame of film whose subject is the Owens Valley and in particular, those silos. In 2010, Lauren described this vision of making a photograph of the landscape out of the landscape, what we came to call the indexical image, this idea of, of this direct representation. It became clear that in order to do this, the photographers had to, in a sense, enter the camera, step through that barrier, we could no longer stand in the privileged position as photographers. We had to enter into the image space, into the latent image of the camera. We actually had to take that step. Like the Borges story, the map and the territory, the map becoming so large that it actually covers the territory and is, in a sense replaces the territory. And that's very much what the pursuit of the indexical image is all about. So the concept that we've just gone through of reactivating this geographic territory between Mount Whitney and Cerro Gordo with the 100 mile dry lake bed through the device of wonder of film began. that Lauren had this pursuit of an image made out of the landscape. The first element, the first ingredient in a sense that was made was a developer. Lauren had seen and gone to this workshop with Robert Shaler in Jamaica where she saw him develop 16 millimeter film out of coffee. So she approached Robert and said, do you think you could make a developer just 
out of the landscape, out of the dust of the Owens Valley. We made a developer out of trona, which is a soda ash that naturally occurs here in the lake bed, along with coffee and vitamin C from orange juice. So in 2010, we started this inquiry to start mining and sourcing all of the material to reinvent photography out of this valley. We've continued that research and one of the things we're looking for is photographic fixer. So sodium thiosulfate is another important component in the photographic process. This is the material that makes the image actually stay on the paper after you've developed it so it doesn't just go away when you let the light touch it. It's sulfur rich out here. All around the lake are these hot springs that are bubbling up sulfide rich water. This is just a chemical soup out here. Millions of years of evaporation has put so much chemistry coming out of both of the mountains on both sides, running out uh, and, and, and filling this lake bed up with everything. It's There's like a periodic table of elements. And that was a discussion that we had with Robert. Mm -hmm. Robert and the three of us sat here on the edge of the lake and surmised that most of the stuff that we need must be out here. These contain basically a solution that reacts with the sodium thiosulfate that we're looking for. So we'll put a sample of this water into a little beaker and we'll suck some of that sample into the vial and the rate that it changes color will tell us exactly how much sodium thiosulfate is occurring. Did you see it just was purple for a second and now it's clear? And how much actual liquid did you pull in? This has a, a very high concentration of this chemical, sodium thiosulfate, which is the fixer component. That's what the fixer is. Fixer is sodium thiosulfate. It's so yes, thing. it's fixer. tested all the different springs all the way around and the results were absolutely not what we were expecting. We found a very concentrated pool of sodium thiosulfate, which is at the end of the road here. And when looking at the satellite map, we realized that the pool was red in color. And that triggered something in my memory from when I was doing all of the research on the geochemistry of this lake. And I was reading about sodium thiosulfate metabolizing bacteria, which are red in color. So one of the theories that we have at this moment is that these pools that are red may actually be the pools that are the richest in sodium thiosulfate because the bacteria are basically looking for the same trace element that we're looking for. Instant. Wow. See the difference? Yeah. That's it's all natural in yeah. a sense. So in a way, this is an ecosystem in itself, even though it's human modified. And in a similar way, something like photography, it's all natural materials. Yeah. Okay, so next stop will be to go to the experiment. The test site. The test site, to dig up the film out of the ooze. So we have a few experiments going here. One of them, this little cairn, this pile of rocks here, we have some film buried under there. And we basically just laid that in the salts here to see how the film will react with the chemistry. And it's just an undeveloped piece of film.
And then we placed some other ones in these pools over here to see if it's any different. So this is a photo of the lake. In this a way, is a chemistry. Yeah, photo. In, in a way, what this experiment was about was just making a pure chemical image. If we could just not expose an image at all, but just see what the natural chemistry, not even thinking about developer and fixer, this is just seeing what the lake itself will do to film. Yeah. You can see the oil slick, kind of iridescence. Wow, we have a lot of colors happening in there. Whoa, look at this though. That went clear yeah, completely, that got stripped. That's, you're right, that's totally clear. Yeah. When working on the lake bed, we were out collecting samples. We had our titration test kit testing different ponds for sodium thiosulfate. We were collecting water samples. So really quickly, as our experimentation continued, the laboratory kind of fell away. And now we're becoming more interested almost in just letting the lake bed be the laboratory that it already is, using the different ponds, the pools that are already there of the brine lake to be our developing trays, and just seeing the natural native chemistry. Exactly, and, and we've talked about that, the aspect of the rhythm of night and day. The night becomes our dark room, and the daytime is our exposure time.
working at an abandoned silver mine or a ghost town called Cerro Gordo, which is also in the Owens Valley. It's in the Inyo Mountains on the other side. And we hadn't been up there for a while. But when she saw that silver was a component, she was like, the, the silver mine, we have to go back to the silver mine. Well, that's the third element in the production of photography. Robert de Maris, or if you're French Canadian, it's de Marais. We're at Cerro Gordo at the 8,000 foot level in the center of town. Cerro Gordo basically was founded by three Mexicans in 1862. By 1865, they got serious about mining. But there was a guy named Victor Baudry down there at Fort Independence who had a store there. He saw the Mexicans bring these nice bricks of high grade silver copper ore down there to the smelter. He thought, you know, I ought to take a look up here. So he came up here. There were 700 registered claims up here, like an anthill, people running around everywhere. Both furnaces running 24 hours a day. Everything from, of course, the Galena silver, limestone, marble. And in the teens, they found some of the richest zinc in the United States from here. They said in one of the mining reports that on a good day, $5,000 worth of ore would come out of here. And supposedly $17 million worth of silver, which translates to a half a billion today. Over 4,000 people were in the Cerro Gordo mining district that encompassed two and a half square miles. There was over 200 buildings up here at one time. There's some 37 miles of underground workings around here. Every flat spot had a building. There were dormitories, bunkhouses, assay offices, seven saloons, three brothels, three famous girls, Lola Travis, Maggie Moore, and Mae Merritt. Supposedly they moved above to the fellowship hall and it's very possible they did because I found five glass perfume bottle stoppers up there. And I figured either the girls were there or the miner smelled good, one or the other. A lot of stuff went on up here. The metabolic group with Valley Crest have did an unbelievable restoration on the hoist house. That building was gonna fall apart. And uh, I was shocked when Lauren came up oh, early in the summer. We met up at the hoist house. I was casting silver buttons. Yep. And she said, I'm gonna do the project. Next week, here comes three tractors and two trucks full of workers. Hey, we need a key to the gate. And I'm sitting there totally dumbfounded. Wow, you know, this, this is gonna happen. that Lauren had talked about was to make a image of the valley from the valley. When silver is a key component in photography and we recognized in order for us to make a photograph from the valley, we needed silver. Well, check this out, Robert. Like this. That. Wow, that's a gorgeous plug. That's triple nine silver. Yeah. And you've got some good silver product in. So in our photography, we're using photographic fixers. So the silver in the film is what makes the black. You know, in a black and white photograph, the black is pieces of silver. When you fix an image, the chemical that makes the image stay, silver gets dissolved into that chemistry. And that's basically photography. You have a light sensitive film. That brings us to working with you up here and actually producing those silver buttons from the Golina that you have coming out of this mine. So what we'd like to do is we've gone through each step and we want to put all the pieces together now to create what we're calling this indexical image, this image that's 
a photograph of the landscape made out of the landscape. Of the landscape. Yeah. So we, what we want your help with is to take this ore and get a purified triple nine piece of silver, of Cerro silver, and that will become the silver that's in our image. The indexical image is about the Owens Valley and the landscape, but it's also about the studio and Lauren and all of us, this larger involvement in the relationships that exist here. You know, the fact that it's not just any silver from Owens Valley, this is Cerro Gordo silver. Galena comes in usually nugget form. But what you're looking for, if you want to pull silver out of Galena in a hurry, is the grain. Shiny, fine salt grain. This is a beautiful specimen here. The finer the grain, the higher the grade. And what you need to do is crush it small as you can in the first place and then put it in your mortars and pestle and grind it up to a powder. Pour it off into your crucible. Mix it up. You need to put a flux in it and stick it in the furnace at a certain temperature. It will get up to 2,500 degrees, which is a little more than you need. I usually run this between 22 and 24, and you can tell by the color eventually what it looks like. When it starts to smoke real good around 2,200 degrees, you know it's getting ready to go. Wow, look at the glow in there right now. It is gorgeous. We've been watching shipping containers pile up in the port of Long Beach. And the real question is, how long will global trade be the dominant way that we exist economically in the world? Why are we importing things that we can make at home? It was the perfect poetic construct to marry the notion of the dry lake bed with this potential chemistry for photography with the space of a camera, which is an empty shipping container, which might contain nothing but image, nothing but the likeness of the world that you're passing by. invention that sticks and lasts is one that there's a need for. There's almost a vacuum. And I think in the studio, there had been a need before the liminal camera for some kind of image capture that was on scale with the scale of Lauren's work. The liminal camera is a 20 foot long intermodal shipping container. These yeah. are the big sea storage containers yeah. that you see getting loaded at the port of Los Angeles. The shipping container essentially just became the archetypal black box, the camera obscura, which is yeah. just a dark room. That became the structure. Liminal, it's sort of a state of in-between of transition, liminal state. So when you're in the camera, you're essentially, you're here, but you're separated from this situation. You observe it and you're not even observing it, the image, you're not even observing it in the right way. It's, it's upside down. We've got eight solar panels on the roof of the camera, lining the entire roof. And they're connected to a 1500 watt industrial inverter and a battery bank. It powers our air conditioning, all of the lighting, everything. It even powers this outlet right here so I can charge my uh, documentation cameras and anything else. Well, this is our camera for inside. This way I can see what's going on in real time. See what I'm doing if I'm backing up. And then of course I can see what the camera is aiming at with this connection. I can see this on any computer, my iPhone. Uh, and we also have a link so you can actually watch this on the internet. So you can watch us work 
in New York while you're sitting in your living room in LA. This is something for $20 you can buy a lens like this. Anybody can do this in their bathroom, black out the window, create an image. It's a box with a hole in it, essentially. And, you know, that's what we built here. It's the, the, the most simple camera. What's really incredible about this is when people get in the camera, they're so used to seeing something that plugs in, and yeah. that's how the magic happens. And it takes a moment for them to realize what we're saying, which is that this is the physical light from the outside. There's no electricity involved. Yeah. This is this is just the physical light being projected through this piece of glass, through this lens, onto this board, and that's what's creating the image. This is a physical property of light. familiar with the phenomenon of light and how it operates but to be inside of this camera it's a giant screen and you see exactly what's happening right beyond the wall a monumentality to that moment when you're standing there and observing the world from that liminal state we have the aperture wide open right now we're going to stop it down to get quite a bit more depth of field how many stops do you want to go down, Rich? I think we should go pretty far. Full, like, full down? Yeah. This right. This will be a very long exposure because yeah. we're going to go way down.
the camera is not only the camera taking the photos, it's the lab developing the photos. So it's a self-contained, deployable film industry unit. It's about independence, it's about ingenuity, it's about, again, all of these themes that we're trying to celebrate when we talk about the mandate to be forward-looking, which is this unique concept of the American West, that we can recreate our universe through a determined desire to move forward with something. display on the iPhone and then it transforms the negative into a positive so we can actually preview our negative in positive in real time right here. It's kind of neat. It becomes like a magic window that we can look through. 30, one minute, one and a half, one and a half or two, right? Yeah. I don't know, two is pretty good. We still have whites in there, you know, our blacks are going to be good. Oh yeah, yeah, look at that. Two minutes, that's okay. what we were thinking anyway. Yeah. Let's do two. Okay. So now we go back in and be very calm for two minutes. What the liminal camera does best is remind us that the photographic image is a, is a real thing. It's not a likeness of something else. So what we lose sometimes with the digital era is that there's a physical absence when you have a digital file. But the liminal camera is its own thing. The physical reality of it and what it photographs is its own world. It's not documenting in a traditional sense. It's creating something unique and real that is similar to what it's photographing, but it's not the same as it. So it's the beginning of reminding ourselves that thing and likeness are not the same thing. In that regard, it's a great tool to communicate what's going on because the images that we're making with the liminal camera have so much presence in and of themselves that they demand that you as a viewer enter them, come to them, not just see them, but you are required to complete them. a schematic diagram for our shot. So here's the silo. Here's the lens of the silo which is going to let light come in and we're going to make a silo cam portrait of the um, liminal camera. So the camera is right down here. We're looking at a moment where the indexical cameras are all 
reflecting one another at the same moment in time. We're talking about this idea of how our participation today is making of a Western. And what the Western was all about is the idea of a reinvented landscape for export to communicate to the rest of the world what the West is about. So today we're reevaluating what filmmaking is for the West because it's no longer simply about the entertainment industry here. It's about allowing this landscape to reinvent itself around a new notion of filmmaking where the landscape material is being used to create a photographic image of, in this case, people here to make a story about it. You rarely get, as a director, such a great moment where you're actually able to look at the history of photography in one shot, making the landscape both the subject and the object of our inquiry. And to really understand the inquiry involves participation. The liminal camera and the silo cam have very different processes of working. It was an extremely complex series of shots that we took, which I found really exciting. Like in the West, you meet, you walk apart, you take your positions, there's a gentleman's agreement that we wait till draw, and in this case, instead of drawing our gun, the lens opens and we all shoot. And it lasts for a moment and then it's all over. End of story.
Mm-hmm.